Welcome to International Hawaii on ThinkTech, where we showcase local import and export companies and the trade industry. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, and today we're chatting with Scott Yoshida, Warehouse Manager at the Foreign Trade Zone. Yay! Full disclosure, I work with Scott at the Foreign Trade Zone, but he's got tons of experience in this industry. So I wanted to bring him on because we never really featured the Foreign Trade Zone yet and what the benefits we offer. So thanks for joining us, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Can you briefly explain to our viewers what the foreign trade zone is? You know, I think uh, a good place to start is um, foreign trade zones deal with goods that are imported and exported from the state of Hawaii. Um, in that process, the first thing we really need to understand is the role of duty and tariffs, because mm -hmm. it's all about duty and tariffs. That's what the benefits are. Um, when you look at goods coming into the state um, that are imported into our islands, um, everything has a classification. And based on that classification, there's a duty rate. Mm -hmm. um, using the foreign trade zone, you're able to defer the duty rate or take advantage of a customs benefit that allows for businesses to store goods um, without paying the duty and taxes until um, they find a market for the goods and they are ready to take the goods out from a warehouse type of environment and pay the duty and taxes at that point. So it's really um, uh, area, the foreign trade zone really is an area to be able to defer duty and taxes for storage. Mm, like help um, with Cash flow. Cash flow. Um, contrary to what everybody thinks, we're not an area where um, you're forced to use the foreign trade zone. Um, we're purely optional. Um, we're actually kind of like an economic development arm that help businesses that um, are not quite set up, ready for opening their own warehouse um, mm. and the cost to incur all the costs involved in developing a warehouse um, so we're kind of like an incubator a step before that where businesses can um, utilize our services um, on a on a volume or space available basis so that means that your charges for usage of a foreign trade zone is not a fixed cost, it's a variable cost. And um, it's based on the amount of volume that's brought into our warehouse. And as goods are removed, your cost decreases. That's great, um, that's a good benefit for small businesses who don't have a lot of cash to just be out, out laying every month. So I guess, um, you know, when people often ask, when we go through a question and answer period, people ask, okay, how do I get started? What do I need to do to introduce product into your warehouse? Um, I always tell them that there are three um, components to setting up storage with us. One um, primary one is there's customs documentation. That comes in a form called a CF-214. Um, that form is a customs form, and it, it basically asks permission from U.S. Customs to move goods in bond before it's cleared into our warehouse. With that form, you submit a commercial invoice, a packing list, and a bill of lading. So that creates a kind of like an introduction package for customs, the customs broker, and the foreign trade zone to look at the goods to determine whether or not it's a good fit for our warehouse. There are certain restrictions. Um, we don't allow explosives. We don't allow contraband. There are, you know, um, por pornography, um, certain types of garment processes are limited. Um, so it's not an open um, mm. invitation to any kind of store, whatever. 
<laughs> especially like chemicals we're not set up to handle chemicals because you know you have to have some expertise in handling chemicals mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um there are some limitations to what we can and cannot do um but basically those three documents which is your um government document which is the 214 and then your shipping documents which is your um, commercial invoice packing list and bill of lading create the information required for us to generate storage based on that um, when that's submitted you're going to submit a set of those documents to your broker because your broker um, your customs broker will provide um, information to you as to what the duty rate on an item is what the cost would be they they're the ones that handle the clearance to enter the goods into commerce a set is submitted to us so that we know what's coming into the warehouse and your customs broker will typically submit that set same set over to u.s customs so that U.S. Customs is aware of what's coming in and they can handle um, appropriately the flow of how the documents should move. Um, when those just, documents, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 just to clarify, when you say when a product is cleared, that means once the duty is paid, right, to Customs and Border Protection. That's correct. So, okay. you know, going back to, um, what happens after you submit the forms to us, we review the forms and typically we assign a lot number um, or a tracking number. We call it a zone lot number. And that's a five digit number that's used to track the goods while it's in our zone. It's only for our usage. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, official assignment of number to your goods, it's only a tracking, um, internal tracking mechanism for us. Um, once the zone lot number has been assigned, the form is then kicked back to your customs broker. And then they take that with the 214 application and submit it to US Customs. Uh, US Customs reviews it and permits it or will sign off or endorse it to say that the document or the shipment can move in bond, in customs bond, into the foreign trade zone. And what that basically means, it's allowing goods to be transferred from the ship into our warehouse mm -hmm. without having cleared where duty and taxes have been paid and the item. So technically the item still cannot be sold into commerce. Mm -hmm. It's in foreign status. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, so it's that like it brings, hasn't arrived yet. It hasn't <laughs> arrived yet. And so that brings the big statement about what is a foreign trade zone. It's an area outside of the United States, but still under customs jurisdiction. So <laughs> goods entering our warehouse, technically, um, it's like a duty free zone where duty and taxes have not been collected. So the goods cannot free flow out into commerce. Mm. It has to be controlled um, in a warehouse where all items are accounted for. Um, Got it. So we Go look at those documents and usually the packing list is a driver for us to create a database. Um, and we create that database in our receiving system. So um, the warehouse or the operation that we provide is pretty, it's a full service setup where we create a database, we receive the goods by SKU or item, we put it into inventory so that a customer or importer is able to reference a specific item and say, I need 10 cases of this item, 10 cases of this item, and we pull it and put it onto the loading zone. So um, it's really a, a full service warehouse operation, um, but it's limited to bulk 
products, mm. meaning that we don't break down cartons, we don't do less than full carton loads. Uh, it's limited to full case slots. So like you couldn't ask for, oh, can I get one thing out of this box or out of the uh, carton? So I don't really call us a distribution center mm. because in a distribution center, I think people are accustomed to being able to open and take and pull out pull out and, certain items and create a custom boxing. Um, everything that we do is governed by um, U.S. Customs. So we have to report um, any type of manipulation that we do. So if a box is opened, we have to mm -hmm. request from Customs to say, can I open a box? Oh. And they'll, on that form, you'll ask for what purpose? To you know to sort or inspect or do you know so um it's all very structured and organized so that we um we account for all the goods that come and go out of our zone mm. what kind of companies use the foreign trade zone you know just about anybody who imports and exports or manufactures um can use so all the foreign kinds trade of companies it's not limited you know we have um footwear we have cosmetics we have um motorcycles and mopeds uh, motor scooters we have obviously gift items like uh, magnets for tourist <laughs> sales you know and that's in the thousands you you get a case with so many gross you know we don't allow people to open up and pull a dozen each out because mm. that would be a, a tracking nightmare so mm -hmm. you know an importer would have to take out a full case so it, it is kind of um, a specialized bulk storage warehouse facility that we offer um, yeah. we also have um, a temperature controlled room it's just an air conditioned space that uh, we try to maintain a set temperature, probably in a range of about 65 degrees, that um, uh, importers bring in wine mm. and sake. Um, that makes sense. And they're able to draw this again by full case lots. Mm. So um, retailing and, and selling out of a Ford trade zone is prohibited. Um, so all the sales and, and exchange of cash has to be done outside of the foreign trade zone. But we're the area that actually creates the orders um, for you to take out and then to market. Um, most of our com the companies that use us have a smaller distribution warehouse that allows them to open boxes and segregate and sort as required so mm -hmm. um it it doesn't utilizing the foreign trade zone doesn't negate the need for another facility to help break down orders it just allows you to store your bulk items here and it allows you to have a smaller space so you know the we have office spaces also in the foreign trade zone and people are able to operate out of their office mm -hmm. um, they're able to take um, some of their product into their office and create the orders that are necessary and have a uh, UPS or FedEx pick up from their office as kind of a fulfillment or distribution area. And mm. the warehouse side of it is the full case lots where we provide that for our clients. So in their offices, they can open up their cases and put together different products together. And, you know, my operation here at the foreign trade zone is limited. Um, it's Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 4 o'clock. Um, but in the mm -hmm. office spaces, you, you're you free to come and go. You have a access mm -hmm. badge that will give you um, ability to come in at any time. 24-7. 24-7. Uh, it's air conditioned. So people are able to operate out of their offices. Nice. We are going to take a quick break. We're watching International Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. My guest today is Scott Yoshida with the Foreign Trade Zone, and we will be right back.
Aloha. I'm Dan Leaf. I go by Fig because I was an Air Force fighter pilot for 33 years, and you have to have a nickname. I get to host on Think Tech Hawaii two shows, Figments, The Power of Imagination, and Figments on Reality. The Power of Imagination introduces you to some of my incredible friends and their life experiences, astronauts, war heroes, Hollywood writers, you name it, they're on it, and you'll be inspired and entertained. And on reality, I'll give you something hard to find, non-political commentary on today's events. That's right, non-political, because the vitriol doesn't help folks. So figments, the power of imagination, figments on reality, both on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, welcome back. This is International Hawaiian Think Tech. And my guest today is Scott Yoshida with the Foreign Trade Zone. And we're talking about the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone for small companies. And I also wanted to ask Scott, like, how did you get started at the Foreign Trade Zone? Like, you've been here for a while, right? Just about 20 years now. Wow. <laughs> what were you doing before? Like, how did you how did you get started at the Foreign Trade Zone? You know, my, my background has always been in um warehousing um although i i started out as a sales rep for a company and then you start understanding the supply chain and what mm. how um the supply chain impacts um what you're able to bring to market um from the supply from being a sales rep i moved into a warehouse operation for a local office supply company um oh. we we're also a major um set bathroom tissue um distributor for kimberly clark um so we we're doing quite a bit of uh freight coming in but not a whole lot of import and export mm. um i left um the warehouse industry and then i went into trucking um i was involved a general manager for a trucking company that um we moved all of the freight, the cargo, the containerized cargo from, um, at the time it was Madsen and Horizon Lines um, mm. to Young Brothers and out to the community. Um, from there, it, uh, the opportunity to join the state as a foreign trade zone operations person became available. And um, fortunately, my background qualified me to um, apply for that position and have been here and enjoyed it. Uh, wow. It's been a very fruitful um, endeavor. That's great. Uh, That's... So, you know, going back to um, my background, I guess when you understand the flow of uh, movement of goods coming into our state, you mm -hmm. understand that Containerized goods goes to the pier. And then from the pier, you have to hire a trucker. The trucker needs to go in there and have an uh, interchange agreement with Matson and Horizon Lines or Pasha Group and Matson right now. And the interchange agreement says, I agree to move these boxes with chassis to a customer and back, I'll be responsible for the item. So mm. an importer has to determine who their trucker is, a selected trucker. And usually a customs broker will guide you along um, on who to select and whose uh, rates are favorable or who are, who's able to move um, containers uh, as needed. Um, mm. So when you retain a, a trucker um, and you notify uh, the shipping company who's the trucker, the boat goods are then released to that trucker. So there is that understanding that they'll be the ones hauling your container away and bringing mm -hmm. it back into pier. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, there's so many steps. Like I feel like there's so many things that could go wrong. <laughs> you know, it's it's. I'm kind of jumping around and I think um, some of the things, the highlights that I, I wanna point out, um, when you hire a trucker, they, they use a lot of 
terminology and acronyms like um, a spot rate. A spot rate is um, to take a container and park it at an area, which is called a container spot. And then you're able to deband the goods. And then the trucker will come back, hook up to the container and take it back to the pier for you. <clears throat> then a trucker might say, oh, is this a live load? That means the container comes to your facility and the trucker stands by while, while the goods are being offloaded. Mm. Um, and that's like a different rate. And that's a different else. rate. You have standby charges, but often the facilities are limiting. So your warehouse might not have the space to spot mm. a 40 foot container. Got it. That brings you back to the foreign trade zone, why we're so important. Because <laughs> we always have space. You can bring a container here and then we can divan it for you and put it mm. away and you can pull it as you need it. Mm. Um, so it kind of all just, flows together. That's great. What could go wrong when importing? Like, what is your worst story that you've heard about importing gone wrong or, you know, something happening to somebody's shipment? You know, I guess um, I want to say about pretty close to 10 years ago, the foreign trade zone was also the container examination station for the state of Hawaii. And basically that meant that we would handle um, containers that customs wanted to inspect. So we got very firsthand knowledge of, you know, what customs is looking for mm, or yeah. why they would seize a container for inspection. So, um, you know, when a container docks into our state, um, there's a couple of different types of exams that Customs looks at. One is they do a spot check. And a spot check usually involves um, a, a vacuous exam or a gamma ray exam where they take the container and they um, x-ray the contents of the container for any anomalies. So it's real important that the declaration that you provide customs on the packing list and commercial invoice is comprehensive because they look at that to say, hey, these are what the item says in here, but I see something in this container that doesn't appear. That triggers an exam. Mm. And that exam is at the importer's expense. Wow. So it could involve um, quite a bit of cost because then the goods are taken over to the examination station, which is currently Island Movers, and the goods are devanned, unloaded until they can, until customs feels assured that they identified the item and they're good to go. Now, customs also has ag implications where they do ag exams mm. so there's a variety of different um functions that cbp or customs has um and what they might be looking for uh, among these are fda requirements that's food and drug administry so you know usually that involves inspection on labeling and marking um, then there's regular customs that looks also at labeling country of origin, mm -hmm. um, labeling that involve product ingredients or ingredients. specifications. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, um, I, I mentioned FDA, you have um, ag exams. So mm -hmm. you can imagine during Christmas when all the Christmas trees come in, mm. um, they go through. And often what exam involves in a Christmas tree exam is they put a sheet of uh, tarp down and they just bang the tree Shake to the tree. see what falls out. 
Yeah. Now, you know, some of the nightmares I've seen is maybe about, again, 10 years ago when we were actively involved in the container exam, um, there's a, a wood boring beetle mm. that came out of China. Mm. It's not uh, a new item into the state, but it can be very devastating. Mm. Um, mm. And that was in all these bamboo products. Um, it just ate through a container of chopsticks. And it just that short mm. one month or two month in transit, it, it gets to be a nightmare. Wow. Um, so as soon as that happens, um, the container is resealed. Um, mm. The importer pays for it's either going to be sent back or it's going to be um, fumigated. Wow. Now, mm. that's, you know, you can imagine the cost involved in, in fumigating, putting a container and, container. you know, using uh, methyl bromide to, to um, try to kill or eradicate any foreign species that comes in here. But usually goods have to be um, fumigated prior to it coming into the island. So often, oh, you know, yeah. there is a chance that it gets um, something bypassed. survives. Yes. So what um, is like an average cost if, if your container got pulled aside by CBP? Like what would it cost an importer? Say if they just went through it and they okayed it, but they didn't really hold it for long. What could it you cost know, you? It could cost anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand dollars, depending <laughs> on, because imagine you order your product, someone loads it. It comes to Hawaii and customs says, I want to look at it. Mm -hmm. So they offload it so customs can do an inspection. Then they have to reload it again so that it can go to your warehouse. Mm. Oh, yeah, so that process for, for pulling it from the pier mm. and offloading it so that customs can inspect it and then to reload it back up is a cost that the importer is responsible for. Wow. So Even if know, everything is fine. Even if everything is fine. Uh, that's horrible. Now, <laughs> I guess it's, it's real important. Um, again, the role of a customs broker mm. is to help run interference on a situation like that. Oh, so the customs broker would be working with CBP. That would be the preference for CBP. On your behalf. Because they, on your behalf, um, emotion, you know, it's my product, what's <laughs> taking so long? Why yeah. is this happening? You yeah. know, if you use a customs broker, um, at least some of that emotion is removed yeah. and it makes it a lot easier dealing with CBP um, right. or for the CBP officers to deal with um, that whole process because it is yeah. a challenge. Yeah. So it's super important for importers to have a customs broker. <laughs> that's, the, Basically. that's the message that I want to send <clears throat> out is that, Good. you know, if... Um, Someone were to ask me what would be the steps or where do how do I start yeah. to use a foreign trade zone? Um, the first thing would be to gather all your costs. Um, that's your shipping costs, your your production costs, and then to take that information and go to see a customs broker so that they can tell you what the clearance or the entry, the duty costs um, are so that you have a clear understanding of uh, your, your full cost of goods of your mm. product. No surprises. It's not just <laughs> the cost to put the product together or manufacture a product. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually the cost involved to bring your product to market. Mm -hmm. Especially in Hawaii. We especially in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so to understand, I guess, your shipping costs, um, that's trucking fees also Everything. included. Um, Got it. And 
you know, how do they determine what the cost is on a container? It's usually driven by the, the commodity. What are you shipping? Huh. Um, Interesting. And the reason why I say that is like, if you ship a container of steel, there's a specific rate for that huh. because they can't do it purely on weight. Yeah. Because if you then also ship, would the cost for a container of steel be the same cost as a container of, of cotton? Now, obviously, there's <laughs> going to be a different charge for the different rates of Got it. what the commodities are. So Got it's it. important that you meet with a broker so that you can go over all of these things yeah. and you know exactly what to share when you're setting up a, a new product or trying to find out, bring a new product into market. And then if people want to start using the foreign trade zone, should they just get in touch with you and tell you I think what they're thinking? The, the, the first step in, in that would be to get your three shipping documents together. Mm -hmm. I need a copy of your bill of lading, your packing list and commercial invoice, mm -hmm. and then to schedule an appointment with me or any of our people here, Cindy or, or Tsurumi Hamasu, who's um, our foreign trade zone representative. Um, any of, of us can review what you're bringing in, determine and give you an idea of what it would cost to bring the product um, into the foreign trade zone. Perfect. Now. You're going to learn a lot of new acronyms like <laughs> FAK, yeah. freight all kinds. Yeah. Generally, that's what we look at. Although we have a specific rate for motorcycles, we have a specific mm. rate for um, alcohol and tobacco. Um, we have a specific rate for. Um, but then all that stuff you'll you'll go over with them, right? That's Once what I'm able in. to go over. Once you bring all the packing information over, Perfect. And we can Perfect. deter. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. I know you have so much more information to share, but we're going to have to wrap this up. You've been watching International Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we've been chatting with Scott Yoshida, Warehouse Manager at Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Number Nine. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been awesome chatting with you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And thank you so much to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Cindy Matsuki. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of International Hawaii. See you next time.